Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may he bless every single one of us. Amin. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, you and I know that we were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I know that the reason that we have been created is made clear by the creator himself. And we do know that life is very short on earth, but the life after death is far longer. In fact, it is eternal. So there are people who don't believe this. And there are people who think that we were created on earth solely to enjoy ourselves while here. Whereas if they were to ponder for a moment, they would realize that the people who have already died and they have already gone forth, they in most cases have been dead for longer than they were alive. So anyone who died 80 years ago, perhaps their life on earth was maybe 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, or up to 80 years. In the case of the majority, I don't even think they got to 80 years. But they have been dead for longer than they were alive. Take a look at those who died 100 years back, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years back. Where are they? And how long have they been dead for? Do you really think that it was... Allah's plan or the maker's plan to say, I will create a sophisticated being, the best of creation, the one with the best of postures, only to come onto a place known as the earth for a short space of time to enjoy themselves and then they will die and that will be the end of it, never to be mentioned again, never to see anything again. Is that what you think that the creator created you for? The answer is obviously no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind or jinn kind except that they worship me, obey my instructions. This is a test for a short period of time. I will decide where they will be born, how they will be born, when they will be born, and so on. To whom they will be born as parents. And I will decide what will happen to them in their lives in order that every single thing that happens to them will be an opportunity for them to get closer to me. Remember that. Every single thing that happens to you and I in our lives is an opportunity for yourselves and myself to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single thing that happens in our lives was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test us, to see how is it that we will respond to the challenges that have occurred in our lives. Or when there is goodness to be done, did we do it? When there is evil to be committed, did we abstain from it? These are the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he created mankind, he decided something very, very important. He decided that I'm going to send to you, O oh mankind, messengers with messages in order for you to learn from those messages. Whoever listens and whoever obeys will be successful. They will have happiness in this world as well as the next. Nobody on earth can ever have every single thing they want. That's impossible. No one. But we have some things that we want because Allah allows it. A lot of what we have is not because we want it, but because we have no option but to have it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us and help us in every single way. So my brothers and sisters, those who have adopted the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, part of his plan is they will be happy on earth. Happy meaning content with their portion. You may not be the wealthiest, but you are surviving. You may not be the prettiest or the most handsome, but someone thinks you're really good looking, mashallah. Someone appreciates you. Someone does. And this is why Allah created everyone differently. We can recognize one another. We can understand one another. We can be attracted to one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this 
Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا We have created you in different tribes or peoples in order that you may recognize one another. Different types of people, different communities, so that you can recognize one another. Different races, different faces, different features. If you come from one part of the world, you perhaps will have features that differ from those who come from another part of the world. This is all the plan of Allah. Ultimately, what will happen to all of us? We will die. When we speak of the last day, there are two types of last days. One is your last day. Qiyamah. One is your last day. The hour. Your last hour. It is a small qiyamah. It is a small judgment, so to speak. Judgment day. al qiyamatu sughra When you die, your deeds are over. Besides the good that you have done in a way that it continues after you've died. If you taught someone goodness, if you did a charitable deed, if you built, for example, a masjid, or if you drilled a borehole, or if you planted a tree, anyone who benefits from anything that you have left behind, you will continue to see that reward until it depletes. Right up to the end of time, the reward of everyone who's benefited and the same applies when you have left an evil example, you will continue to receive the sin of it up to the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So when I die, when you die, it's the end. The end of what? Your life, my life. It's the hour, the last hour, my last hour, your last hour. But there is a greater last hour. And what is it? It is the end of time when the whole world will come to an end. Made mention of in so many verses of the Quran. There are dedicated surahs, chapters of the Quran that have been named after the day of judgment or the end or that which is a reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it so vividly. So many places. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّ زَلْزَلَةَ السَّاعَةِ شَيْءٌ عَظِيمٌ O people, be conscious of your Rabb. Indeed, the tremor of the hour is a reality. It is something very grand, very big. The last moments will be very severe, very intense. يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَتْ وَتَضَعُ كُلُّ ذَاتِ حَمْلٍ حَمْلَهَا وَتَرَى النَّاسَ سُكَارًا وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارًا وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٌ The opening verses of Surah Al-Hajj where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this end and Allah says Three things. On that day, the one or the mother who is suckling will forget what she is doing. She will drop the child. She will forget about the child. Imagine the concentration that is needed when breastfeeding a child is enormous. And the connection is even greater between the child and the mother. But for the mother to suddenly stand up and start running without thinking of what she is doing, there has to be something chaotic happening. Something very serious happening. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those expectant mothers will deliver prematurely. They will deliver what they are holding. A huge sound and suddenly, even though the nine months are not complete of gestation, but the child was delivered. Subhanallah. Because of the shock of the hour. And Allah says, people will be as though they are intoxicated, but they will not have had anything intoxicating. You know, you say, he looks like a madman. Why? Not because he's mad, but because perhaps he's so confused. Perhaps something grand, something big has happened. Sometimes disastrous has taken place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us on that day. So these are some of the descriptions of the end. However, Allah has favored us. In the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day a man came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the presence of his companions. 
This hadith is known as the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. And the hadith describes how the companions say a man walked in. He was very good looking. He was wearing white. He had black hair. No one knew him from amongst us because he was not from our community. And he had no sign of having undertaken a journey. So we don't even, we couldn't even tell that he was from afar. But he came in, he sat in, the, in front of Muhammad sallallahu with the knees touching. And he started asking him questions. And as he asked him the questions, he was, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was replying. And with these responses, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu each time a question was asked, was saying something. And this man was saying, yes, you've spoken the truth. Imagine someone comes and asks you, how old are you? And you give them your age and say, you are speaking the truth. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Well, if you knew it, why did you ask me? But this was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent Jibreel alayhi salam in the form of a human being. As explained at the end of the hadith. Where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu asked his companions, do you know who that was? They say, no. He said, that was Jibreel alayhi salam. He came to you to teach you your faith. Question and answer. It helps you to, bra to expand your knowledge. He asked a question in order that the answer can be articulated so that you can hear and all of you can benefit. So from among the questions, he says, what is Islam? The answer came. He said, you're speaking the truth. What is Iman? The answer came. He said, you're speaking the truth. But the topic we have today, he says, after that, he asked, what is Ihsan? You're speaking the truth. Then he says, well, when will be the hour? When is the end going to come? When is the end going to come? So the Prophet Muhammad says, Mal mas'oolu anha bi a'lama min as sail The one who is being questioned does not have more knowledge than the one questioning in this regard. In this regard, the one who is asking and the one who is being asked are the same. We don't know. Allah has kept the knowledge with himself. In the Quran, Allah says, Inna Allah indahu ilmu Indeed, Allah with him is the knowledge of the hour. Exactly when things are going to end, Allah has kept it with him. He has not informed anyone. He will inform the angel responsible to blow the trumpet when the blowing of the trumpet is required. When he wants it to happen, he will instruct at that moment that angel to blow the trumpet. The angel does not know when that is going to be. And according to one narration of Muhammad sallallahu that angel named Israfil, according to some of the narrations, has actually taken hold of the trumpet and taken a breath to blow into the trumpet and is waiting for the instruction. That's how close it is. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, ana I have been sent myself and the hour, the end, just like these two fingers. And he joined his two fingers. Can you see how close they are? So he, if he is the last prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what that means is after him, you can expect the hour, the end. Because all the previous prophets have come. Now there is no other prophet to come. We have the end remaining. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the questions that were asked by the people of Quraysh to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي They ask you, when is this hour going to be sent? Tell them the knowledge of it is with my Rabb. It is with my Lord. It is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Jibreel alayhi salam heard this answer, he said, well, what are the signs of the hour? What are the signs of the end? And so he gave a few of the signs. And inshallah, within the next two days, we are going to be going through some of these signs, some of the prophecies. However, when we speak about prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we need to know three categories amongst other categories. The three main categories of the prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as follows. One, those things that he prophesied that were seen in the lives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam within a short space of time. So he prophesied, for example, let me give you a few examples. Just before the battle of Badr, that was one of the first major battles, the first major battle that occurred 
after the Meccan period, while the Muslimin had migrated to Medina Munawwara, just under two years down the line, the first major battle occurred. That was the Battle of Badr. The Prophet ﷺ had actually shown his companions, this is where this person will lose his life. Abu Jahl, for example. This is where this man is going to lose his life. This is where that man is going to lose his life. When the battle was over, they saw exactly the same spot. This was prophesied by Muhammad ﷺ. Exactly the same spot where this man lay, he was no longer living. This man lay, no longer alive. The other one, no longer alive. Subhanallah, this was a prophecy. The Sahaba anhum were strengthened by that. Amazing. These are the prophecies of Muhammad ﷺ. There were prophecies made by others, but... When a messenger, peace be upon him, makes a prophecy, it is absolutely accurate. It can never be wrong. Because Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Najm, وَمَا يَنطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا The messenger, peace be upon him, does not utter any utterance out of his whims and fancies. It is all revelation that has been revealed even though it may be his own words. The difference between the Quran and the hadith of Muhammad ﷺ is that the Quran, the wording is from Allah. It is sacred wording. It is the word spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to the hadith of Muhammad ﷺ, it is from Allah spoken by the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. That's the difference. One, when I'm speaking about the words of Allah, I'm not allowed to just say, oh, I think this is the verse. I must come with the exact verse or I must come with the closest possible meaning. If I'm translating it into another language, the closest possible meaning. But if I'm uttering the Arabic language, I need to say exactly what Allah said. And every one of us human beings, Muslimin, we need to memorize at least a small portion of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exactly as they were spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's amazing. When it comes to the hadith or the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I'm allowed to say, well, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said words to this effect and then I can quote or I can say to the best of my knowledge, this is what it is. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa never uttered that which was false. He did not utter that which contradicted his own statements or that which was in the Quran. Many people look at the Quran and they say, well, the Quran in one place prohibits intoxicants and in the other place it says that there is a little bit of good in it or there is good and bad in it, but the bad outweighs the good. So why the contradiction? One says it's haram and the other says there is some good in it. If you were to have learned the Quran from a correct source, you would know that that same Quran has been revealed over a period of 23 years. And the prohibition of alcohol did not just come in one day. It came over a period of time. After many years, alcohol was prohibited. Initially, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created resentment in the hearts of those who were drinking alcohol by saying that it has more bad in it than good. People like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, they never ever drank that which was intoxicating because they knew common sense. If I have this brain that distinguishes me from animal, why should I lose it? Why should I do something that will make me lose my brain, my mind? So they didn't drink. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, there will come a time when people will consider intoxicants. Okay. He's prophesized it. They will call it a different name perhaps. He says the same about interest and usury. They will call it a different name and they will eat it. They won't mind. They know what's prohibited, but they will call it a different name. Like bribery, for example. Nowadays, they call it a gift. You can call it a gift. You can call it anything else. It's not a gift. It's a bribe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his life, another very, very interesting prophecy that he had made that the companions saw in their lives. This is the truth. It happened. The battle of the 
trench took place known as Al Ahzab, where the allies had all formed an alliance and they came to attack the Muslimin. And the Prophet Muhammad said, This will be our last battle with them. Wow, imagine how exciting that sounded. This will be our last battle with them. And it was indeed the last battle. They went the following year or sometime later to Hudaybiyah. They wanted to make Umrah. They went to Makkah al Mukarramah in Ihram. The Meccans did not allow the Muslims to enter Makkah al Mukarramah. And they sent Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu into Makkah in order to try and speak to the leaders of Makkah. There was a rumor that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was murdered in Makkah. The Muslims who were not armed, they were not prepared for battle or war. They had come peacefully in order to make the minor pilgrimage known as the Umrah. What happened to them? They pledged allegiance. They pledged to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam under a tree later to become known as Ash-Shajara, the tree, the tree. When we are speaking of the tree, we are, taking, we are speaking about the tree in Hudaybiyah, the tree under which the Muslims pledged to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that we are going to die in order to save Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu or in order to revenge what happened to him. We don't mind. So the Prophet sallallahu at that juncture, the Muslims, those who knew the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu they knew perhaps we won't fight here. There's not going to be a war here. But at that point too, there were verses of the Quran revealed predicting the victory of Makkah. The, the Kuffar in a nutshell did not allow the Muslims to enter Makkah. They said, come back next year. And they had not harmed Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. They had not harmed Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He came back. The Muslims were happy. When they were leaving, the Prophet sallallahu received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Indeed, we have granted you a clear victory. Clear victory. Imagine they didn't allow us in. They told us to go back. We were now going back and Allah says, we have given you a clear victory, open victory. My brothers and sisters, when negative things happen in your lives, sometimes it's the beginning of some really nice things that are about to happen in your life. Remember this, you lost your job. Perhaps Allah wanted you to open a company that might become bigger than the company that you worked for. Subhanallah, it's possible. That's why just be patient. You went through a divorce, for example, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to get to someone far better than the spouse that you had. Allahu Akbar. It can happen. Be patient, sabr. That's what you need. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and some of the companions asked, Afathun who? Is this actually a victory? The verses are revealed. We have given you a victory. Is this really a victory? The Prophet ﷺ says, yes, it is indeed a victory. And Allah revealed many more verses explaining. And guess what? In no time, there were many points of victory. One, that peace gave opportunity for the message of Islam to move across the globe, to be spread to different parts and regions. And secondly, some time later, the Kuffar of Quraysh broke the treaty. So the Muslimin in large numbers marched onto Mecca and the victory of Mecca took place. So that victory of Mecca was predicted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. It was prophesized and they saw it. It came to be. Amazing. Similarly, there are other prophecies. The second category of prophecies. The first one in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they saw it and it came to pass. The second are those that were prophesied. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions saw them and they are existing up to this day and growing. They are growing. So those were also prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The increase in sin or for example, the dress code degenerating as time passes, you have seen the dress code today. It's getting worse as time passes. It's not getting any better. Subhanallah, I can quickly explain to you. There was a time when man wore very little. 
So here comes the civilized world and they said, cover up. You know, in Africa, where I come from, the traditional clothing, perhaps the skin of a buck or an animal, maybe from a cow or from a goat, perhaps, and they would wear to cover the front and the back of their private parts. That's it. And perhaps they might, they might have moved around with a few spears in order to protect themselves. That was considered the traditional dress. That's how they used to dress. So here comes the so-called civilized world and gave them clothing and told them, listen, cover yourself. Because if you cover yourself, you are civilized. So then they started wearing, mashallah, tabarakallah, something, you know, to cover their legs, something to cover the top. The women used to wear the long dresses. They used to have hats. The Victorian era, those hats used to have nets and the net used to come down the face. Mashallah, not only neat, but romantic too, mashallah. And so what happened? They covered themselves correctly. Islam came about and did exactly the same thing. The people used to engage in circumambulation of the Kaaba, known as Tawaf, while they were naked at times. They used to inherit the women, treat them as property. Islam abolished all of that. And Islam says, cover yourself. It's better for you. Ya ayyuhan nabi yukul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina alayhin yudnina alayhin min jalabibihin thalika adna an yu'arafna fala yu'zayin O messenger, tell your wives, tell your daughters and tell the believing women to dress with their outer garment. You know, when you're leaving the home, you just put on an outer garment. Dress with the outer garment. Because it is better for them to be recognized as chaste women. It is better for them to be recognized as believing women. It is better for them to be recognized with goodness. Rather than to be dressing so provocatively that you are looked at as a sex object as someone who may be cheap, someone who is trying to perhaps stir up the feelings or emotions, etc., of the opposite sex, it would be better if you dressed modestly, if you dressed in a way that would make you a person known as someone who respects themselves to begin with. And that's what the civilized world taught at one stage. Later on, when man wanted to control a woman again and wanted her to forget about what civilization had brought, you know what happened? And the hadith has predicted this. The dressing will degenerate once again. There will be a swap of dress code. Men will dress with the clothing of women and women will dress with the clothing of men. Subhanallah. Such that you won't know the difference. Is this a man or a woman? Good morning, sir. I'm a madam. Oh, oh sorry. I'm sorry. Morning, ma'am. Who told you I'm a madam? Well, it's your clothing. But no, subhanallah. Nowadays, you just say good morning. It's over. You don't need to say sir or madam. If you're a Muslim, you're fortunate. You can say salam alaikum, my brother. At least they have beards, alhamdulillah. So... <laughs> The prediction of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that, or the prophecy that the clothing would degenerate. If we take a look today, they will tell you that part of civilization is actually to undress. The less you wear, the more liberated you are. What happened to our forefathers only 50 years ago, who actually fought nudity in order to bring in civilization? What happened to that? Take a look at the colonialists who went across the globe. What did they do? I'm talking of dress code. They taught that, look, cover yourselves. They came to Africa. They taught us in Africa to cover ourselves. Now they're changing their minds. Why? Why once again? Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, Islam teaches you purity. Islam says you will not be judged because you have nice legs. You will not be judged because your hair blows in the wind. You will not be judged because your face is flawless. You will not be judged because of 
you the shape of your body you will be judged because of who you are how your character and conduct is and how your relationship with your maker is you will be judged by your contribution to humankind and your dedication to the maker of humankind subhanallah that's islam so allah says just cover when people look at you they mustn't say salam alaikum how are you wow just because you look nice you know alhamdulillah you look so good everyone's greeting you no they should greet you with respect based on the fact that you are a decent human being and a servant of allah a creature of allah that is islam that is the purity of islam when allah says cover yourself it is in order for you to earn respect wallahi those who don't cover themselves they can say what they want they are making themselves cheap very very cheap and they are insulting the other sisters or the others of the same gender who may not have exactly what they have they are adding so much pressure on society and community people are dying as a result of wanting to be size zero you know what happens they used to say oh this person's a size 10 well mashallah not bad size 8 okay fine sorry i should have started at 14. Uh, <laughs> Then also it's Alhamdulillah. Okay. They get down until they get to size one. You almost, you have almost disappeared. What happened to you? You don't eat. And after that, no size zero. Hello, sister. Where are you? You were here a minute ago. What happened? Oh, totally invisible. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Don't let this happen to you, my beloved brothers and sisters. You need to understand the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, that's the second category of prophecies. Those prophecies that were seen at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and they grew. And the third category, those that were prophesized, they are seen in our lives. Those that are prophesized, that will be seen still to come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Let me give you some of these prophecies. Did you know that the Prophet ﷺ says there will come a time when immorality will increase so much so that sexual encounters will become a norm of the day such that people will engage in intimacy in full view of the public. So, so much so that the most moral from amongst them, the best that he or she will ever be able to say is you know what if you want to do your thing there is a wall just go behind it astaghfirullah that's in the hadith of the prophet ﷺ. immorality will increase people will become loose in terms of moral behavior such that they will literally engage in sex in public and the most upright from amongst them won't even be able to say don't do it but he or she will say why don't you just go behind this wall to do your thing astaghfirullah we see today, my brothers and sisters, we are living in a hyper-sexualized environment. Everything is about sex. We cannot deny that. It was a prophecy of Muhammad ﷺ. One might ask, well, there are prophecies. These prophecies, are they evil? What are they? Some of the prophecies are depicting and showing us that sin will increase and it will increase. Some of the prophecies are actually good prophecies. For example, when we are taught that the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him, is going to come back onto the earth. That cannot be something bad. It's something good. So some of these prophecies are good things, not bad things. And some of them are permissible things. I give you an example. There is a prophecy. The Prophet ﷺ says, there will come a time when you see the Arab Bedouins who don't have shoes to wear, meaning who did not have shoes to wear at one stage. They will be so wealthy they will literally be competing with one another. They will be competing with one another regarding the height of the buildings that they built. No one can deny this narration. A few years ago, we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have seen. But now we see. One says, you know what? In Makkah al Mukarramah, as you walk out, you see these tall buildings. Is it a bad thing? The answer is no, it's not a bad thing. No hadith says it's an evil thing. It is necessary. You know, I remember once, and I'm going to say this because people say, Astaghfirullah. I, you know, once I was sitting in the mataf, true story. And I met a brother saying, Astaghfirullah, look at this. These guys, these are all signs of Qiyamah. Look at them. They are preparing for Dajjal's arrival. And I'm saying, hang on, brother. 
What are you talking about? Look at this building. Look at how tall it is. You know which building I'm talking about. The ones just outside the haram. Look at how tall they are. I said, but brother, you know they have to cater for 2 million, 3 million, 5 million hujjaj, which is a small, small, small percentage of the 2 billion that we are on the globe. How long did it take you to make your hajj? He says, well, I applied for three years and I got, got it after three years. I said, you know, there are people in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, various other countries. It takes much longer for them to get to hajj. So they have to accommodate. So that's why they have to put up buildings going upwards because they cannot do it. Going sideways, no one wants to stay far from the haram. No one wants to live in expensive accommodation. And no one wants to stay in a small room. Everyone wants a big room that is cheap, that is right next to the Kaaba. Everyone wants that. It's a fact. Everyone wants, if you say, what's your ideal accommodation in Makkah? Say it must be close. Must be a good room. Must be cheap. MashaAllah. Come on, you have to sacrifice one of them. If it's close, it won't be cheap. Right? And if it's a little bit big, it's not going to be cheap either. And in Makkah, trust me, it's always fighting for space. So I said, well, they decided to go upwards. It's a sign of Qiyamah. So it's a sign of Qiyamah. There are so many other signs of Qiyamah. By the way, we got up, we fulfilled our salah, and we were walking out. And he says, would you like to join me for supper? I said, oh, where do you stay? He was quiet. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, where do you stay? <laughs> I looked at him, I said, just tell me, where do you stay? He said, you know, astaghfirullah, I stay in this building. <laughs> I said, well, they made it for you. Perhaps you are a moving sign of Qiyamah. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. They made it for you in order to accommodate you and those who want to come for Hajj. So the point I'm raising, it's, it's not necessarily an evil thing. If it is a necessity, it has to happen. It's not a sinful thing if there is a necessity. But if you are just, one, if you are just bragging about it, it becomes bad. You built a building, 30 floors. I'm building 31 floors. There's no need for it, but I'm putting 31 because I want it to be higher than yours. The minute the, another brother hears that, he says, I'm putting up one with 60. Then I'm putting up one with 100, like an auction. Then it becomes bad. I hope you're following the point here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So that is a prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an example of those things that are not absolutely evil. They can become evil if the intention is wrong and if it's unnecessary, etc. Then we have another prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, There will come a time when nothing will remain of Islam except its name. And nothing will remain of the Quran except its drawing. You know, the writing. The masjids will be packed and they will be very well built and beautiful. But they will be void of guidance. A person will go into the masjid, they will come out with no guidance at all. Nothing. You have beautiful mosques. Millions of dollars are spent to build the mosque. You go inside, the imam cannot even read the Quran. You go inside, there is no even lecture. There is no Islamic program. The masjid is now just the function is ceremonial. That's it. Sign of the hour. It has happened, it is happening and it will happen. That's a bad sign. How many people, what's your name? Muhammad. But the brother has a bottle of alcohol in his hand. That's a prophecy of Muhammad wasallam that people will have... Islam only as a name, nothing more. Let's not be moving signs of the hour. Your name is Khadija, Fatima, Abdullah, Muhammad, Zakaria, whatever else your name might be. Remember one thing, you need to live Islam. Don't let it just be your name. The Quran, don't let it just be written. A lot of us have beautiful Qurans. When we get married, sometimes we give a gift of the Quran. I know it happens in a lot of parts of the world. That Quran is just on the shelf until 30 years later. Subhanallah. 30 years later. <laughs> Talking about 30 years later, there was something I read this morning. They say, you know, normally as Muslimin, we have happy marriages by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But once in a while, you get a marriage where the husband feels he's in a jail. He's doomed. So the man says to his wife, 20 years later, after marriage, 20 years after marriage, he says to his wife, do you remember just before we married, your father caught us together. Whoa, that's not supposed to have happened. It's supposed, you're supposed to have met me with the blessings of my father in the presence of some mahram or at least with them knowing and perhaps supervising somehow. Anyway, yes, I do remember, she says. And he put a gun at my head and he says, you marry her, 
or I will jail you for 20 years. And she says, yeah, I remember that. I'm so sorry, you know. I do remember that, yeah. And this man is crying. And it's looking so romantic, right? 20 year anniversary, that's what it was. Wow. And she says, oh my darling, yeah, I do remember that 20 years back. Ooh. But why are you crying? He says, because if I was jailed today, I would have been released. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. <laughs> if I was jailed today, I would have been released. Divorce will be on the increase. There we are. Another prophecy. There will be lots of divorce. Marital problems. Leading to adultery. Leading to so much more. So much adultery. So much fornication. People won't bother. It won't even tickle them. When a mu'min commits a sin, he or she feels in the heart, what I've done is wrong. That's a sign you're a mu'min. But there will come a time when people won't even feel it in the heart. When people won't even feel it in the heart. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. The hadith says, there will come a time when killing and mass murder will occur. People will die in large numbers. There will be lots of disasters on the globe. And there will come a time when the murderer who is murdering won't know why he is killing. And the one being killed won't know why he is being killed. Take a look at the chaos on the globe today. Prophesized by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People are killing, not knowing why they are killing. Who are you killing? And why are they dying? And the person dying, I don't even know why you are killing me. There are Muslims, the name of Islam being used, killing other Muslims, just calling them kafir, fasiq, fajir, whatever other name, in order to justify their killing. And they are killing others who are absolutely innocent wherever they are on the globe. And they're just saying, no, they deserve to die. But why? I don't know. They just deserve to die. Sometimes the instruction of someone above, go out and massacre, murder. And what has happened? They're doing it. Why? I don't know. My boss told me to do that. But these are innocent human beings. No. And the person says, why are you killing me? I don't know. I was told to kill you. Imagine, these are the prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says there will come a time when people won't be bothered whether what they are eating is actually halal or not. When you say this is doubtful in Islam, by right, if you have a doubt, you're supposed to be leaving it in order to save yourself. The probabilities or possibility of you consuming haram would be eradicated because you didn't consume it. But today, even that which we are told is haram, people say, well, it's okay, it's fine. Not a problem. They will go out and gamble. They will go out and do so many things. These things have been prophesied by Muhammad sallallahu He says, knowledge will be snatched away by the death of the scholars until the ignorant will be considered knowledgeable and they will be asked questions. They will respond in a way that their misguidance will lead to the misguidance of others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. It's important to look at where you're getting your knowledge from. People have misconstrued, misinterpreted the entire Quran or parts of it. And they are teaching it to others, pretending or making it out to be the, that the Quran is a book full of barbarism or that promotes mass murder and so on. Yet it is a book filled with peace and justice. How? Well, you need to learn. Similarly, there will come a time when people will not respect their parents anymore. Not at all. They won't be bothered. These are prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine where he says, That hadith I spoke about at the beginning, hadith Jibreel. In it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, give me some of the signs. And he mentioned some of the signs. From amongst them, he says, a woman will give birth to her boss. Slave woman will give birth to her master. The meaning of that can be taken in so many ways. One of them is children will be ruling their parents. You and I know today we can't even tell our children anything. You say something, that's it. Life becomes a mess. So people just let it pass. Let it happen. Dad, this year, holiday, we're going to Lankawi. If we don't, you're not my dad. No problem. We'll go to Lankawi this year and next year. Huh. Welcome, Dad. You're a rich man, huh? Mashallah. Thereafter, we have another narration. The Prophet ﷺ also says, 
zaman. There will come a time when, and this is a sign of the hour. A sign of the hour. Time will be crumpled. So, 45 minutes that I've already spoken will just seem like 4 to 5 minutes, right? Allahu Akbar. They are making a sign to me to say my time is up. It's a sign of the hour. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's a sign of the hour. The time flies. Time will fly. That's a sign of the hour. Getting a little bit more serious, what that would mean is 10 years will pass by like one year. One year will pass by like a month. A month will pass by like a week. A week will pass by like a day. A day will pass by like an hour and so on. Take a look at us. A lot of us, if you were to think about the past, a few years ago, you were just a child. A few years ago was the day when you got married. I see some people shaking their heads. Don't worry, you'll get married, inshallah. You will be married one day, inshallah. May Allah make it easy. But these are the prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I've only mentioned some of them. And inshallah, within the next two days, we will be going through a few more. Some of the, my colleagues will probably speak on other topics. And I will be back with you again, inshallah, with a little bit more of this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all. We are so, so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having given us a lot of these signs and prophecies. And they have indeed come true. There are so many of them. And indeed, it, they should strengthen us in our belief. And we know that everything predicted and prophesied by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has either come true during his lifetime or later on or is about to come true. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease and goodness and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us the few good deeds that we have done. May he forgive all our shortcomings and strengthen us. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.